Imagine that you have a loop-de-loop -loop. and this loop-de-loop -loop is basically just a circle and we're going to say that the radius of this circle, we're going to call it radius r, we're going to say that that radius is 2.7 meters. And we want to find the least speed v we're going to say that V is unknown, but we're trying to find this least speed that a ball would have at the top of the loop in order to remain in contact with the loop at the very, very top. Okay. So we can assume that this ball travels through the top of the loop in something known as uniform circular motion. So uniform circular motion basically just means that there is a specific relationship between the particle's acceleration and its velocity. And this um, relationship is given by the equation A equals V squared over R, where V is the constant velocity of the particle traveling in the circle and R is the radius of the circle. And note here that this relationship only holds when um, we have a known velocity and this velocity is constant because if it isn't constant, that means the particle is actually accelerating in the circle and moving faster in the circle itself and not just accelerating perpendicularly to move in that circle. And unlike the acceleration that we've been working with previously, this acceleration is perpendicular to the direction of the particle's motion. So previously we were working with boxes. Let's say we have a box and it's moving at some velocity. The acceleration is in that same line. It's in the same axis, right? So it can either be accelerating to the right or it can be accelerating to the left or decelerating in this case. But with uniform circular motion, what we're saying is that, let's say we have the same box, but this time we are accelerating, let's say this way, this is the acceleration, but the velocity is going this way. So they are perpendicular to each other. Okay. So now for this problem, the acceleration of the particle or the ball at the top of the motion is going to be pointed downwards, directed toward the center of the loop. We're going to call that center O. We can draw a free body diagram, of course, as we always want to do when we're working with force problems, to represent the ball at the top of the loop-to-loop. -loop. So at the top, we have the normal force that is directed downwards because the ball is on the track and the track applies a downward force on the ball. And we also always have the force of gravity from the ball itself also directed downwards. So this means that our acceleration is pointed downwards provided by the net force. And now with our force in the free body diagram, we can write down Newton's second law equation for the y components. So if we have the f net in the y direction equals mass times acceleration in the y direction, we get that negative fn, focusing on the sign here, minus f of g is equal to m times negative a. And we're including all the negative signs because they're all pointed downwards. And now we can substitute this important equation that we have here into our Newton's second law equation. And this gives us negative Fn, we can substitute mg, and here minus mg equals m times negative v squared over r, where v squared over r is something we call the centripetal acceleration. So this is the centripetal acceleration. And this is just the acceleration that is perpendicular to the velocity and changes its direction. Okay, so if we want the ball to have the least speed of V to remain in contact, then it's basically on the verge of losing contact with the loop-to-loop, -loop, which means it is sort of falling away from the loop and 
that tells us that the normal force is equal to zero in the problem that we are trying to solve. So we can substitute zero for Fn, and we get that mg equals m times v squared over r. So that means that v equals square root of g times r after both the m's cancel out. And in our problem, that is 9.8 meters per second squared times 2.7 meters, all under a square root, and that is 5.1 meters per second once you calculate it out. So that is uniform circular motion. And in addition to the acceleration at a constant speed, we know that the time is related to the velocity by distance over velocity. And the distance that a particle travels when it's traveling in a circle is just the circumference of that circle. So that would be 2 pi r. And we divide by the velocity. And this value is known as t, which is known as the period of the revolution of the circular motion. And generally, it is a time for a particle to go around a closed path exactly once. But be careful that this only applies to motion with a constant velocity in a circle. And you'll see, if you think about it, that the problem that we just solved in a loop-to-loop -loop actually does not have a constant velocity all throughout its motion. Okay? And just as a little teaser, here's why. Let's say that we're looking at the ball at the bottom of its motion here. At the bottom of its motion, the force in the free body diagram looks something like this. The normal force is pointing up, while the force of gravity is pointing down. So already we have a difference in the free body diagram. Actually, sorry, it should look something like this. The normal force would be greater than the force of gravity now, because the centripetal acceleration is now directed toward the top, also towards the center of the circle. And if you'll notice, the acceleration is always directed towards the center of the circle. So that means whichever way the net force is in our free body diagram has to be in the direction of the centripetal acceleration. So let's just get rid of a common mistake, the centripetal acceleration or the centripetal force because accelerations are related to forces. This is not a separate force or acceleration. This is a resultant net force that points toward the center of some circular motion. So for example, if we have this free body diagram over here, the centripetal force would just be the net force in the y direction. We could call that F centripetal. And this would just be Fn minus Fg. OK, but in the problem that we just solved, the centripetal force was this force over here negative Fn minus Fg. So immediately we recognize that the centripetal acceleration is not the same at the top versus the bottom. So that means that our period equation does not hold true because the velocity is not constant. But for problems which do have a constant velocity around a circle, you can apply this period equation. Okay, so that is it for a introduction to uniform circular motion and centripetal acceleration. In the next video, I'm going to be doing a proof of how we got the relationship between acceleration and velocity. So stay tuned for that. Thank you, and I hope you have learned something new.